Was there. that lobbyist coming in and saying, actually, guys, you know, it's not that bad? Like, like the biggest lobbies are inside of the groups, you know. Right. There's the game we play, there's the mm. cards we are dealt with. MEP Mikhail Vizik there, kicking off the highlights of our latest Climate Now panel debate, hosted in the heart of Brussels. We were asking how climate data is shaping EU policy, and we ended up talking a lot about lobbying. Here's MEP Delara Burkhardt. There's a misrepresentation on who has access to actually influence um, po political decision makers. There is a, a big growing number of different industry-sided mm. lobbyists that have a huge inflict, uh, impact on the debates in Brussels. You as an MEP, as a good MEP, might be able to filter which lobbies actually provides you with solid data. So I think from the Commission's perspective, we're uh, interested in engaging in anybody who's willing to embark on the transition to climate neutrality. Vicky Pollard from the European Commission's Directorate General for Climate Action there, underlining their point of view. But the politicians say that it's still tricky to convince some of their colleagues to support climate-friendly policies. The current parliament is less green compared to the previous one, that's, that's for sure. There is more climate denial going on in the debates where it's said that it's not the climate change, it's the weather always has been changing and the floods always, ha extreme weather events always happened. So there is a denial. You hear that being said out loud. Yeah. We hear that it's being said out loud. And that's in spite of the fact that we have the EU's Copernicus program, which is feeding us with data about how our planet is changing every day, represented on the panel by ECMWF's Director General, Florence Rabier. So what we are doing is providing science-based facts. We are really doing unbiased information based on the latest science and technology. We also have these interactive tools where you can navigate these IPCC projections and you can really look at your country or your region and see what it would it look like in one of the scenarios of greenhouse gas emissions. This is the climate atlas, right? This is the climate atlas. Yep. Yeah, it's yep. an interactive climate atlas. Or what would it look like in a plus three degrees or plus four degrees? And recently, we've also have a, a new tool, which is Climate Pulse, that really gives you real-time information of where we are. Like, today was warmer by one degree compared to pre-industrial uh, times or things like that. However... Maybe I would like to stress that there's still a lot of denial. I think that reality is very helping. In, in this regard, in 2019, EP was able to declare a climate emergency. A lot of people were not believing that, and I think that the number of people who deny that fact is actually lower after, after these floods, after these droughts, after these heat waves, you know. Michal's point being that when people feel the effects of climate change directly and personally, well, then they tend to take it more seriously which does raise a question of how we plan to adapt. And we need to really up our game in terms of preparing for the, not the climate that we have now, but the climate mm. which will inevitably come, even if we take action to be in 1.5 degrees. To help us to do that, the EU is developing something called Destination Earth, which is a kind of digital twin of the planet, where you can play around with the different parameters and see what would happen. So sort of digital replica of the, ad of the atmosphere, of the climate, that are at high resolution, so the resolution that is needed for, to, to adapt to it, but also what you, when you can test some what-if scenarios. Mm. So you can replay some, some simulations. We're saying, what if we plant trees? What if we, we do this with reservoirs, etc.? Now that sounds useful, as does a new European satellite mission called CO2M, which will actually measure emissions from space, giving us data we don't have today. So in 2027, we might be able to better disentangle what is coming from natural sources and what are the emissions. The conversation also turned to geoengineering, which covers everything from sucking CO2 out of the air to putting fine particles in the upper atmosphere. The European Commission is working out how to regulate it, just in case somebody outside Europe starts down that path. But it's part of the debate, um, and because there may be people in, uh, 
tempted to go down that route. We need to understand mm. its implications and ensure that we have robust regulation because it could be applied elsewhere in the world and it would ha could have impacts on, mm. on the EU. Boris, can I bring you in on this? It needs to be investigated. Right. But for sure, we don't know what it does to the ozone layer. We know that it's not going to counteract some other effects of climate change because the CO2 will still be there. So like ocean acidification or ecological uh, damage, etc. And, uh, and we know it will cost a lot and you probably need to, to do it for decades, if not centuries, to be effective. Overall, one of the big messages to come out of our panel is that we do have plenty of data about how our planet is changing already. But what's missing is great representation in Brussels for the science. If I could wish for something, it would be science lo lobbyists in, in Brussels. Um, <laughs> because often I hear that they don't know when the sweet spot is, when you should counteract with parliamentarians to, in order to make your point. Um, so this would be helpful uh, to know when you should set up your posters at Brussels Airport uh, in order to reach MEPs. There has to be more observation on the communication side of when to, to actually interfere or to give your comments um, on current legislation process. Fascinating. Uh, and yeah. if not, then name and shame those who are not responsive to the science. I think <laughs> Indeed. Well, a quick thank you to our online and studio audience for all of their questions. It was great to hear from you. Please follow the link in the description to watch the full one hour version of this conversation and head over to euronews.com slash climate now for my latest report on how the Alps are changing as the glaciers melt. I'll see you soon. <laughs>